first time in the first hymn. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this, our harvest service and celebration here at Long Causeway Church this morning. And welcome if you're watching on Zoom or you catch up with us later. It's lovely to see you all. Lovely to have Carol leading us in worship this morning. Uh, I think all notices are on your sheet. However, if you are going to join us for Bible study, which starts this Friday in person, um, I have some notes, or I will have when I go and print them. So see me after, during coffee, uh, if you want to join, and I hope lots of you will join us for that, uh, which we're being led by uh, Reverend David Barker. Uh, starting with some lunch and then uh, carrying on looking at the Book of Ruth. Um, if anybody would like to lead one of the in Zoom sessions, uh, please have a word with me and uh, we'd like to start those up again also studying the book of uh, Ruth. So if anybody feels able to lead a Zoom session uh, and facilitate it, then please let me know. I think everything else is possibly on there. So we are now going to look at the screen to see what's next. Family time, thank you. So. Does anybody have any, oh, we've got a hand up already over there. It's Grandad's birthday. No way, it's Grandad's birthday this morning, John Hall. <laughs> I think we'll have to sing in a minute, won't we? You'll remind me if I forget by the time I've done this, won't you? Because I do have a knack of doing that. Anything else? No? That's it. We had a lovely messy church yesterday, nine children and families. Hey, Lynn. Oh, yes, you say something. Hello, everyone. I know I'm late, but it's been for a good cause, hasn't it? Uh, I'd just like to tell you, I don't know if any of you know, but up the arcade, Princess of Wales, by Boots the Chemist, there's an old... There's a shop opened up with the old, very old pictures of Dewsbury, and it's wonderful. You want to go in and look at it. There's places you'll remember everybody from one to eighty, one to ninety. So please go. <laughs> Thank you. Do you want to leave those here now rather than yeah? I'd just like to thank anyone who's written the name down for um, this this Saturday. So it's um, mu much appreciated. Thank you. <laughs> the wedding this Saturday. Still time. Last time. Last chance to pop your name on the list if you'd like to come to a wedding. Well, I think what I'm going to say it uh, it comes from lots and lots of people that were John uh, were at John's party yesterday. Thank you so much to the halls. It was so wonderful. I'm rubbish on an, on an evening, as you all know, but at what we had, want it brilliant. Thank you so much. Happy birthday, John. Wonderful. Good morning, everybody. Just a little update on Jill and Tony Beckett. Um, Jill's still in hospital. Please continue to keep her in your prayers. She's still not mobile. She's transferring from one place to the other, so that's slight improvement. But unfortunately, Tony visited yesterday, and he was taken to A&E because he had a funny turn. And I think it's possible he had a TIA. Um, they did send him home after six hours, so um, he's being cared for by the two daughters, Ruth and Claire, so he's in good hands. And Alan Evans, I found out now, he's in Dewsbury Hospital, and I believe it's Ward 8. So that's much easier if anybody would like to visit. Do you want to say something? I'd just like to say Richard and myself became great grandparents again last week, on Monday. She's gorgeous. <laughs> Yeah, thanks for coming last night. The vision of 
Keith reciting a poem about a budgie while a human budgie strutted behind him making noise as well. I should remember that. What I'd like to say is thank the church because when it came to clean away, I didn't have to ask anybody, but hands appeared from all over the place to help, so I appreciate that. But two big thank yous. One to Beth. Go upstairs and have a look at this amazing cake she's made. And when I come up, I'll cut it up and we'll have it with coffee. So thanks, Beth. It's, it's beyond words. It's lovely. And I've got to tell, thank you, my mate Sally here. I was supposed to be in the kitchen, but I was in and out. And I was sweet fanny all. I didn't really do it this time. But she, um, Sally did. She just managed that kitchen by herself last night and produced all that food. So thanks, Sal. That was great. Oh, sorry. One last thing. Um, somebody's made a comment about the windowsills. The bread is two years old, so don't take it home with you. <laughs> it's still ongoing, it's varnished. Uh, and the tomatoes and fruit has been given by the supermarket because they were going to landfill it. It's still in date, uh, but they ordered too much. So if you want to take a bowl of, what are they, tomatoes home with you, do. Thank you, Pam. Sorry, I missed it. Sounds a wonderful evening. Um, just on, on another note, uh, uh, with Beth here this morning again as well, I hope you all get a chance to walk past the, sh the cafe windows, which are absolutely fabulous. So we are so grateful to you, Beth, and to Carol, for the wonderful work that you do, because they, they are a conversation starter and a people stopper. They are wonderful. Thank you so much. Round of applause again, I think, folks. <laughs> And we've got a little bit of something, I think. <laughs> Thank you. Well, it's fallen to me, John, to wish you a happy birthday. I was thinking this morning, if I was asked, I've known you <laughs> since we were very small. Sunday school, you didn't take much notice of me because you were a lot older than me. He is a lot older than me. <laughs> yeah, but we've been through Sunday school, been through um, youth group uh, on walks and everything, youth hostling, everything. And who's to know that you, you and Jeff married such young women? <laughs> and, and beautiful. Oh, oh. Please, please accept this and another one from church. Um, I was told that you wanted a plant, but I thought, well, I'll save you having to dig. <laughs> so these are already planted, and I thought you could put them by the side of your door or something like that. Oh, that's super. So, yes. So do you want to say a few words or not? Yeah. Well, I'm not very good at saying words, but uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, thank you for your cards and your best wishes and everything. And I love you all. church yesterday by the way we made these uh, this autumn uh, wind hanging thing which i think looks quite effective doesn't it we'll possibly put it somewhere else uh now before we uh, carry on carol you're ready to go we will pray let's say our growth prayer together god of mission who alone brings growth to your church send your holy spirit to give vision to our planning wisdom to our actions joy to our worship and power to our witness. Help our church to grow in numbers, in spiritual commitment to you, and in service to our local community. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. from Psalm 67, verse 1. 
verse 6, the land has yielded its harvest. God, our God, has blessed us. So shall we sing our first harvest hymn, which is Come, Little People, Come. And if you have gifts to bring out, now's the opportunity to do it. Let's sing hymn, Come, You Thankful People, Come. Please be seated. Let's pray together. Generous God, we thank you for the gifts that you've given for all people to share. We plant seeds of hope and nurture them as we seek a harvest of plenty for all. Forgive us for the times these seeds fail to take root in our hearts. We grieve when homes and crops are washed away by floods, when lives are uprooted by war and disaster, or trampled by fear and greed. Living God, you lead us to a new way of being. Move us to help one another in our times of need, to care for the earth, and to love one another, sharing your harvest with all. Amen. Let's say together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Uh, we're going to have a little musical interlude now. Um, the choir are going to sing an anthem for you by, by John Rutter, and I thought it would be very appropriate for harvest. It's called Look at the World. And we're grouping.
Now then, um, some of you have got paper bags in your pew. Has anybody not got one? Anyone not got one? Let's give some more. Joe, do you need one? <laughs> Just be careful putting your hand in because some of the things are a bit spiky. There's, there's some at the back. There's some at the back. We can have a few there. Thank you, Margaret. Now, what's inside? Conkers and beech nuts. Ian's looking at me like I've done things out of order. <laughs> Sorry. They all look a little bit different, don't they? They're all just a little bit spiky and bristly, and some are hard, and some are shiny, and some are a bit scaly. Some of the seeds have come out of casings and some are still inside. Some of the casings have opened up like flowers, like the beech nuts. And I don't know if some of you got beech nuts, they're almost um, like little, little pyramids. They're quite angular, the beech nuts that have come out inside. All of these have potential, don't they? Potential for what? For growth and um, what will they grow into, Georgie? What what are these things going to grow into? Into trees, into trees. Yeah. What sort of a, a tree grows from an acorn? An oak. Yes, I got it in stereo there. Well done. With the right conditions, they can be transformed, but they need the right environment in which to grow, don't they? Hydration, nutrition, warmth, and it's almost magical. Ian's going to hopefully play a little clip of this transformation right now.
of an added bonus on the end there. Very funny. Just, just touch some of those seeds and those casings again. And I wonder, as you think about that tree growing miraculously from a tiny little thing, it was about six months, was it? Five or six months it took to grow a, a, an oak sapling that was this hard. Some of us can be a bit like that chestnut casing, can't we? We can be a bit spiky and we can be a bit cross. Or like the beech nut casing, we can be bristly when we think that somebody's got the wrong end of the stick. Just like the smoothness of that conker or the acorn, we can be sometimes hard skinned when really inside we're just as soft and vulnerable as everyone else. Just as the beech nut, the conker, and the acorn are transformed, so can we be. Our families nurture us and give us food and warmth and the right conditions to thrive. Things like coming to church is a way of nurturing you. Your parents would, um, we've just heard from Sally and John, brought you to church when you were little. Showing that the love of God is just as important as your Weetabix and your duvet. God not only allows us to grow in faith, he provides us with spiritual food in the teachings of Jesus and with the warmth in the fellowship of church. We're all growing and we can all bear fruit. They might not be acorns and conkers, but God wants us to spread the seeds of our faith so that others can experience the love of God too. And sometimes the seeds don't grow. Sometimes they land in the wrong place or the conditions aren't just right. But some will. And that's God's miracle, isn't it? Next time you go kicking autumn leaves, think of the acorns and how flipping fabulous creation is when you think of those growing seeds. I'm going to ask Sally to read a, a short reading from the Psalms and I'm giving her my phone because it's a particular translation that I wanted to read. Just before I start, I don't know whether people can remember, a few oh, months or so ago, I did a children's address here where we had broad bean seeds. And um, we actually, they were growing and we planted them in the garden. And guess what? We actually got enough. Did you get a crop? To, well, yes, not a lot. <laughs> not a lot, but just small enough for us to have a crop. So that was my gardening expertise. <laughs> Um, this is Psalm of David, and it's 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all your iniquity? Who heals all your diseases? Who redeems your life from the pit? who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy. Thanks. The words of that psalm have been set to music and we're going to sing that hymn now. It talks of 10,000 reasons to be grateful and to thank, the, thank God for all of his blessings. And here we have them in front of us, what blessings we've been given that we're able to share. Um, it's called Bless the Lord, O My Soul, and we'll take the collection during this hymn.
Lord, you bless us with so many gifts and we have so much to thank you for. We share our gifts of food and money with you and ask your guidance that this may grow your kingdom like acorns to mighty oaks. Bless our children and their leaders as they leave for fun, games, fellowship and finding out about you. Amen. Sally's going to give the second reading now, which is from Matthew chapter 6. I love this chapter. I love the, all of it. It's, it's absolutely a wonderful chapter. But this is, is um, from verse 25. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is life not imp more important than food, and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you by worrying can add a single hour to his life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the fields grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat? Or, What shall we drink? Or, What shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Amen. You might feel the urge at this point, having heard that reading, to sing the uh, Bob Marley, Bobby McFerrin version of Here's a little song I wrote, I'd like to sing it note for note, don't worry, be happy. But we're not, we're going to sing hymn number 99 instead. We're going to sing All Creatures of Our God and King.
our gospel reading today, there's one word that gets repeated over and over, the word worry. Not that worry is something that Jesus is recommending, it's something he's warning us against. If you're at all like me, you might find this a little hard to take. The author of the Narnia story, C.S. Lewis, was a devout Christian, but he admitted that his whole life long, he struggled against a tendency to be a worrier. Commenting on this passage, he said, if God wanted us to live like the birds of the air, it would have been nice for him to give us a constitution that was more like theirs. And I'm sure you can sympathize with that. I know I can. I do tend to be a worrier. Don't worry, be happy sounds great in theory, but how do you put it into practice? So far as we can tell, Jesus doesn't seem to have been a person who worried a great deal. He lived his life on the principle of trusting God, his heavenly father, and he tried to teach his followers to do the same. And it seems to me that there are three basic attitudes at the heart of Jesus's experience of life. Three attitudes reflected in this passage. Joy, trust, and focus. First, joy. Joy in the good things the Heavenly Father has created. I'm delighted to find Jesus recommending this as a good hobby when he said, look at the birds of the air. Ian's going to show us the next picture. We've no reason to believe that Jesus hadn't taken his own advice. He must have spent hours watching the birds diving and swooping <coughs> on the currents above the Galilean hills, simply enjoying being alive. I'm reminded of walking up to the top of the woodland area at Harlow Carr in Harrogate with Beth and hearing first and then seeing the screeching red kites wheeling overhead. It seemed like the birds were just playing in the wind. They would flap their wings and work hard to climb up higher and higher. And then when they reached a certain point, they would just let go and dive and swoop around until they lost the power of the thermal pocket that they'd found. Then they'd go through the whole process again. And we watched them for ages. And as far as we could tell, this activity had no useful purpose. They weren't on the lookout for prey. None of them broke away and swooped down to catch a field mice or something. They just seemed to be enjoying riding on the air, just as God had created them to. I'm sure Jesus had watched birds do this sort of thing many times, and he'd figured out that they never seemed to weary themselves doing the kind of work that humans do, and yet somehow they seemed to stay alive and well. Jesus, too, had seen all the flowers, thousands of different species. The word um, translated lilies of the field here actually refers to several different plants. And he had been moved by their fragile beauty. Uh, this photo is taken at a, at a little farm near Helmsley in North Yorkshire that Beth and I visited. And it was just fields and fields of wildflowers. And it was stunning. One moment, Jesus might be standing in the field surrounded by these flowers, and the next moment, the flowers could get trampled underfoot. Trampled by a horse, by cattle, animals, cut down with a scythe, and yet year after year, the beauty would return. Where did all this beauty come from? The flowers didn't spend thousands on clothes, nor did they spend several hours a week in a tanning studio getting a good tan, or in front of a mirror putting on makeup. They were just themselves, beautiful, God-given, and free. Jesus lived a life of joy because he not only enjoyed the creation around him, but he received it as a gift from the creator, the father of all. And none of it was about ownership. Jesus didn't have to own the birds in order to enjoy them. He didn't have to own a field to enjoy the beauty of the flowers. He could simply receive it all. As a gift from God. And this leads us to the second attitude at the heart of Jesus's experience of life and that is trust in the Father. I was blessed with a good father and mother, my parents, 
When my three siblings and I were children, my dad worked hard to put food on the table for us. When he was made redundant from the travel industry and became a full-time actor who was, let's face it, often resting, my mum became the major breadwinner. I need to put the next photo up, thanks Ian. Oh, look at little Beth on the end there. And tiny Douglas in the red sweater. Tiny blonde Douglas. <laughs> Between them, they always provided what we needed. We didn't have fancy holidays, but I don't ever remember being worried about not having food to eat or clothes to wear. It didn't mean my parents let us sit around and do nothing, of course. They required us to do our bit, to help with household jobs, etc. We knew that they loved us. We could be secure. And we knew that if need be, they would sacrifice their own comfort to make sure that we had everything we needed. And Jesus had that sort of trust in his Heavenly Father. He had a strong sense of the goodness of God. To him, the goodness of the created world was a sign of the goodness of its creator. And his teaching grew out of his own experience. When he told his followers not to worry about tomorrow, we can assume that he had learned this attitude by putting it into practice himself. He knew that the creator of all beauty was not a stern and stingy killjoy, but a loving and utterly dependable father. And because of this relationship, he was able to break free of the tyranny of worry and focus on things that really mattered. So even though Jesus seems to have known all along that the cross was ahead for him, I don't get the sense he was looking ahead anxiously, worrying about what was coming next. Rather, he seems to have been able to live in the moment, live for the now, giving his attention to the present task, the present need, the person in front of him. Celebrating the goodness of God here and now, and he wants us to do the same. It's important to recognise, isn't it, that when Jesus tells us not to worry about food and drink and clothing, he's not saying these things don't matter. He doesn't mean we should try and live the life of an ascetic, eating and drinking as little as possible and wearing, like John the Baptist, the most ragged, moth-eaten clothes. No, he, he enjoyed the good things of life. He loved sharing fellowship with people in people's homes and eating good food. He was telling us that we're the children of a loving father who wants us to give good gifts to his children. We can trust our father to provide for us just as he provides for all creation. So yes, we should plant seeds. We should reap harvest. We should work hard and mend things, work at our own jobs and earn money to pay others for these things, as most of us do today but we should do it all with joy. Because God is not a mean tyrant who's out to get us and make life difficult. He is our loving Father who wants to care for us and give us the fruits of the earth as a gift. And it's right that we share those gifts today and that Care Dewsbury will be able to share these provisions with folk who need them so that they too can feel loved, noticed, cared for and provided for. Finally, Jesus would advise us to choose our focus wisely. In the passage that Sally read, he says, no one can serve two masters, for a slave will either hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to one and despise the other. You can't serve God and wealth. So we're getting to the heart of the matter. The reason he was able to live in joyful trust with his heavenly father was that he'd made God's priorities his own and he challenges us to do the same thing. Seek the kingdom of God, make it the number one value of your life and God will respond by providing what you need to live. That's Jesus' message. What's the kingdom of God? Well, it means God's power and love at work to heal the world and restore it to its original intention and plan. 
that God's reign of compassion and justice and peace will be established and last forever. He challenges us to work towards a world where everyone has enough, no one has too much. A world in which future generations will still be able to enjoy the birds of the air and the lilies of the field like we do. And it includes spreading the good news, calling everyone to be disciples. So those three attitudes that Jesus lived by, joy in God and in all good things that God has made, trust in the goodness of the Heavenly Father and the daily provision for our needs, and focus, above all, not on accumulating wealth for ourselves, but on doing God's will and striving with him in the healing of the world. It sounds good, doesn't it? Better than living by the principle of the one who dies with the most toys wins. Better than accumulating mountains of luxuries and then spending days worrying that someone's going to steal them from us. Which would you rather do? Walk through what the old prayer book calls the changes and chances of this mortal life with only your own skill and strength to depend on? Or walk through life with your hand in God's hand, focusing on the right things and trusting God to provide the necessities. I know which sounds better. I'm not there yet, not by a long shot, but I'm going to pray that Jesus will teach me to find the joy in God's creation, to trust in the goodness of God, and to focus my attention on seeking God's kingdom, sharing God's love, doing God's will, and perhaps then, like the acorn, we too can be transformed. Amen. Let's come to a time of prayer for the world. Lord, tomorrow we will mark a year since the October the 7th attacks in Israel. And Lord, we lament the situation in the Middle East. We pray so hard, Lord, that world leaders and powerful organisations with influence will intervene and bring the threat of war to an end. We pray so hard, Lord, for the families that have lost loved ones, for the homes that have been destroyed, for the displacement of people from their land, and for the despair that must be felt. We pray so hard, Lord, for faith leaders in our country to become intercessors of peace to restore trust and communication in our local areas so that groups of different faiths and culture and heritage can live side by side without fear and without prejudice. In our hometowns here in West Yorkshire, we pray that we would live with other faiths and traditions with tolerance, with generosity and shared concern for our neighbours. We pray, Lord, that this season will bring a harvest of peace, that spears will be turned to plowshares, that guns fall silent, that wounds will be healed. Lord, we know that you understand everything on our hearts. You know all of our concerns. You know the names of our loved ones who are sick and who need your comfort. You know the sadnesses and joys in each of our hearts. You know how much we pray for Alan, for Jill and Tony, for the members of our church who are going through tough times. Lord, in a moment of silence, we bring our prayers for the world, for our church and our families to you.
Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Amen. So we come to our final hymn. Um, jo mentioned Beth's windows, uh, her design for um, the cafe windows that have an autumn theme. And uh, well done, Beth, they look really lovely. And there's a line of this next hymn that features in one of the windows. And it shows every passerby that this witness of faith marks this building out as a place of blessing, of prayer, of fellowship, and especially today, of sharing. All I have needed, thy hand has provided. Great is thy faithfulness. My thanks to Ian, to uh, the flower team, Pam and Marilyn, for the beautiful decorations in church, for the choir and David 
and uh, the door stewards, thank you for your um, help putting today together. Lord, we bless you, God of seed and harvest. We bless each other that the beauty of this world and the love that created it might be expressed through our lives and be a blessing that transforms others, now and always. Amen. <laughs>